Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh annual Community College Conference, Globalizing the Community College Curriculum, Add Food and Stir. This is sponsored by the University of Arizona Centers for East Asian Studies, Latin American Studies, and Middle Eastern Studies, and the Center for Educational Resources in Culture, Language, and Literacy, usually called CIRCLE, because it's shorter. We are delighted to be meeting in person again and to have all of you here. Please check the conference website for details about the schedule. Uh, before we get into the content of the conference, I just want to let you know about the centers, what we are, what we do. We are Title VI resource centers funded by grants by the US, uh, from the U.S. Department of Education to promote learning about the rest of the world, including languages, cultures, and world affairs. Each area studies center uh, promotes learning about its area. So the centers also have a mandate from the Department of Education to help globalize the curriculum at both K-12 and community college levels. And this is obviously where you all come in. This is just one of our programs that includes community college instructors. We also provide assistance in curriculum uh, development in all of our world areas. We advertise programs around the country and world for professional development, help provide guest speakers to classes, and organize trips to our world areas, among other things. If you have suggestions about how we can help you globalize your curricula, please let us know. We would love to hear your ideas. Uh, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Center for Latin American Studies, and CIRCLE have been at the U University of Arizona for many years, and we are delighted to welcome the brand new Center for East Asian Studies to campus as well this year. Um, the directors and associate directors of the various centers will be in and out of the conference. I'm just going to introduce a few people who are here now. Um, First, I'm going to start with our outreach coordinators, who are the ones who put this conference together. Uh, that is, um, we've got Katrina, Dr. Katrina Dillon, hiding over there in the back. Uh, she is the outreach director at the Center for Latin American Studies. We have uh, David Kawabata. He is the Outreach and Program Coordinator at the Center for East Asian Studies, and I'm Dr. Abby Limmer, uh, Assistant Director for Educational Outreach at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and please just call me Abby. Um, I also would like to introduce uh, our, and, and thank Juanita Sandoval. She is our graduate. She's our graduate student assistant. She has been invaluable in putting this uh, weekend together. Um, and uh, also, I want to acknowledge the other people here from our centers. We have uh, Dr. Ann Betteridge, the uh, director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Um, from CIRCLE, we have, uh, uh, we have Kate Mackay, who is the associate director, and uh, Marisol Aguirre. Uh, their new outreach coordinator. We hmm. And from the Center for Latin American Studies, we have uh, Colin Deeds, the associate director. Uh, all of these people are what make are the ones who make things like this possible. And now I would like to introduce again the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Professor Ann Betteridge. Professor Betteridge is an anthropologist with a degree from the University of Chicago. Her area of expertise is women in Iran, and she will introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Well, thanks so much. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to our seventh annual Community College Curriculum Internationalization Conference. And I'd also like to add my thanks to Abby's, to, to Trina Dillon, David Kawabata, Abby Limmer, and Juanita Sandoval for all that it took to pull this together. It's um, no mean feat, and we really appreciate it. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's keynote speaker, Gary Paul Nathan. We could have no better guide to what we can learn by considering international aspects of food. A reviewer of his book, Desert Terroir, described him as an ethnobotanist who writes beautifully about the intersection of food, culture, and geography. He'll get us off to an excellent start. Gary Paul Naupon is also a Lebanese American who spent time in his family's villages, homes, and convents in Lebanon, Oman, and Syria. As the Kellogg Endowed Chair in Food and Water Security for the Borderlands at the University of Arizona, he's also lectured at universities in Italy, Lebanon, Mexico, and Oman. 
For two decades, he's been tracing the agricultural, culinary, and linguistic diffusion of seeds, trees, recipes, and farming practices from the Middle East to the America in four waves. Phoenician and pre-Islamic colonization of ports on the Iberian Peninsula and possibly the Canaries. Mozarabe and Sephardic refugees from the Spanish Inquisition leaving Spain to settle in the Canaries or go through, in quotes, blood cleansing to ship to the Americas. Early Spanish, Mozarabe and Converso settlement in the Jesuit and Franciscan era in the southwest, northern Mexico, and the Yucatan Peninsula, and recent Levantine emigration from the 1880s to the present into the desert borderlands. Gary Nalpon was a MacArthur Fellow, co-founder of Native Seed Search. That's, for those of you who don't know, a nonprofit that conserves and sells heirloom seeds of the southwest, and also a science advisor to our Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. His book, Gathering the Desert, won the Burroughs Medal for Nature Writing. He's also written prolifically on ethnobotany, nutrition, and plant conservation. Among his 34 solely authored, co-authored, or edited volumes are three on the topics in this evening's lecture, Arab American Landscape, Culture, and Cuisine in Two Great Deserts, and Desert Tawar, um, exploring the unique flavors and sundry places of the borderlands from the University of Arizona Press, and Cumin, Camels, and Caravans, a Spice Odyssey from the University of California Press. Gary Nalpan has also served on the boards of the American Arab American Writers Guild, RAWI, the Orion Society, which offers programming that explores how we live with the natural world, Native Seed Search, and other nonprofits. This spring, he's retiring from academia to spend time designing Arab-inspired fragrance gardens, um, I'd really love to spend time in some of those, and to write more creative nonfiction and poetry. He's also an ecumenical Franciscan brother. This evening, Gary Nabhan will trace international connections for us as he discusses Middle Eastern food and farming diffusion, flavors from Arabia to the arid Southwest and Mexico. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Gary Nabhan. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Anne and Abby, for uh, keeping me on track to be here. I was this morning and yesterday up to my knees in uh, uh, dirt and planting trees and things like that. So it, it made me humble that all the farmers I'm talking about do real work that I've been uh, privileged to avoid at some points in my life. Uh, but I'm so grateful this, for this convergence of different kinds of scholars and, and sponsoring centers. I love the work that Latin American Studies here has done and uh, have just been an admirer for, of Anne's work uh, here at the university since she arrived. And I'm just so grateful to be with all of you. So thank you all for your goodwill. And I hope you have fun with this uh, uh, topic. Uh, the next few days, and we'll start off by having some fun with it now. Whenever we sit down to dinner here in the US-Mexico borderlands, whenever we move water in a ditch to irrigate our vegetable crops, whenever we brush our teeth, whenever we listen to uh, a classical string music uh, uh, consort, Whenever we eat meatball soup, bread pudding, honey-dipped fritters like sopapillas, or stuffed chilies like chiles en hogadas, uh, we are echoing traditions from the Middle East that pass through North Africa, Moorish Spain, the Canary Islands, and Mexico to land in our laps. And there's echoes, reverberations of um, Persian and Arabic uh, sensibilities, uh, ideas about cuisine and linguistic tracings of words that we use every day here in the Southwest that began halfway around the world um, in another era, three to 4,000 years ago, that still echo in our daily lives here in the Southwest. And I think that's the really fun part of this story. Hidden in our daily lives are hints of our debt to Phoenician, Persian, Arab, Punic, Berber, Morisco, Converso, 
and Canarian innovators and cultural creatives. Uh, some of them, like my hero, uh, Ziryab, the, the blackbird, or, or great innovator uh, in uh, Moorish Spain, uh, just was uh, not only a polyglot in terms of knowing many languages, but so skilled in music and cuisine and storytelling and other things that he still sort of boggles the mind of how someone could be that creative. Uh, centuries ago, and that is still so strongly remembered um, in Spain and elsewhere in the world. And yet, those processes of cultural diffusion that I've just mentioned, of seeds, of fruits, grains, recipes, and water management techniques, seldom make it into the way that world history is taught at different levels of education. Um, I can't remember any of that in my high school or undergraduate days, and that's not to, to disparage my great teachers and professors. A lot of the great scholarship hadn't emerged to the extent that it is today. And then I think there was an explosion of this that I'll talk about later with the quincentenary of the Columbus voyage, where our whole view of what that voyage was about and who was on it changed radically, and we'll get to that later. But that is that um, hidden um, role that the Arab and Persian and North African influences have, particularly in Mexico and the US Southwest, and to some extent in Florida, um, is something that one um, gastronomic historian years ago uh, lamented in print in this way. He said, we know more about the names of the bastard children of salacious kings in Europe than we know about what people ate and drank in centuries past. In other words, we have a lot of archival records of the political history, but the daily lives of the people that are we're just like us, uh, um, spending time with their family, spending time gardening, uh, moving from one place for another after war or drought. We, we tend to lose those unless we really drill down and find references to them. And again, that's not to diminish um, anyone who's taught world history in the past without <laughs> dealing with those topics. But I think we have a particular role here in Tucson, now that we're the first UNESCO city of gastronomy in the United States, uh, and one of, I think, eight desert cities in the world that are now in a network uh, within the UNESCO Creative Cities uh, larger network to daylight those stories, to tell people of those cultural connections, and to learn from other uh, nation cities and cultures about the connectivity that really links us in our uh, pleasures and in some of the more lamentable um, incidents that happened throughout history. Uh, in fact, I would say that Tucson's almost the perfect place to do that. We have um, long connections at this university with most of the Arab-speaking countries, um, where when I was in graduate school here, some of my classes were more students from North Africa, the Middle East, and, um, and of course, from Mexico and other Latin American countries than there were uh, Americans who were born in this country. And so I think we're at one of those communities that's a crossroads where we have the opportunity to tell those stories in a beautiful and hopefully accurate way. So let me just get started first with some of the things that are hidden from sight that show those connections, and then we'll talk about the processes that help them arrive here, as I said, in our laps, or in some cases, in our mouths. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to mention a number of foods that we can find in Mexican restaurants here throughout Metro Tucson that 
uh, hint of those origins. Um, some of them are just so familiar to us that we, we can't any, even imagine there's a hidden story in them because it just seems that they're omnipresent in a place like this. Imagine um, starting out um, for a family dinner, a celebration of a birthday or, or, or anniversary of your grandparents or, or aunts and uncles here in Tucson, and you go into a big me Mexican restaurant and a long table, probably like we'll have at the Bosnian restaurant tonight. And uh, the first things that are brought to you or you're given a choice of as appetizers are a ceviche, um, a gazpacho, uh, a sope de albondegas, or a cazuela or cocido, a kind of stew type soup. Well, um, then you move on to um, something like a, a mole uh, with, with chicken or turkey, sometimes on rice or other, another grain for a pilaf. Or you have a choice of uh, carne machaca con verduras, uh, uh, dried meat that's rehydrated and mixed with vegetables. Or you go real fancy and you get the classic dish that I always thought until recently originated in the state of Puebla called uh, chiles en hogada, uh, uh, ch stuffed chilies in a walnut sauce. And then for, um, or, and of course, if you've come into that dinner already with a hangover from the night before, you might want to have a menudo instead of a gazpacho or a bondegas. And then uh, for dinner, or I mean for dessert, you have a choice of a uh, Sopapilla or bunuelo, or uh, a wonderful marzipan cookie with al almond flour called uh, uh, alfajor, and um, or a bread pudding called a caperotada. Every single one of those dishes has echoes back to the Middle East and North Africa, and. And some of them are evident in the names we, we use. The albondega soup I, I, uh, uh, may have different spices in with uh, the lamb or pork or beef that's used. That I grew up in a Lebanese family where we always had lamb um, uh, for, for uh, that. But the, the etymological root of albondegas is albundak, which is a hazelnut. And the, the original meatballs in parts of the Middle East were tiny, tiny little meatballs, not those big things that you get in frozen uh, uh, packages at Walmart. They were tiny little things the size of a walnut, and often they were served in a walnut sauce, so it was like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not walnut, hazelnut, excuse me. Hazelnut, albundak. Uh, so that name has echoed all the way through from uh, Lebanon and Syria, the Levant, all the way across North Africa into Moorish Spain, Andalusia, Al Andalus, and throughout Latin America. Um, another one that um, I love like that is. Uh, uh, carne machaca that um, is also in some places like the Canary Islands called carne machuca. But it's usually a dried meat uh, that then is rehydrated if you're a desert people. Uh, to store anything in dehydrated form until there's a time of water or until the, you're at a well or another source of water is very important. And one thing we have a lot of is sun and heat to make de dehydrated food. <laughs> so that kind of processing that use very little water to begin with, but then you can soak it overnight and rehydrate it and serve it the next day is something that we find all the way through that sweep of countries. Um, menudo goes by many different names, but some are, are related to the sp uh, Spanish word uh, callos, which people also use for 
scallops. But there's an older entomology that goes back to Morocco and uh, the other parts of the Maghreb and um, uh, made Menudo and Gaspacho have ancient, ancient uh, Middle Eastern and uh, Arabic roots. We now think of gazpacho as something um, that is sort of a, a tomato-based summer, uh, cold summer soup. But most gazpachos in Spain, and historically because tomatoes weren't in Spain until uh, 1540 or something like that, were a garlic and bread-based soup, soup rather than one with uh, tomatoes if it had a vegetable in it, it was cucumbers or eggplants. And there's a lot of very, very interesting linguistic um, uh, name flipping, uh, uh, a thing that uh, um, ethnobotanists and linguists uh, pay a lot of attention to where originally then, for example, the name uh, for tomatoes in Italian is pomodoro. Some people say that that was originally the name for eggplant. Eggplants can, are not just that beautiful, rich, almost bluish black color, but red ones and yellow ones. So almost the same range of shapes and colors uh, that are in North African eggplants. And at some point, tomatoes became more important than eggplants in Italy and other parts of the Mediterranean. And the name for certain of those uh, nightshade fruits switched from eggplant to tomatoes. Uh, another um, wonderful uh, tradition are the cazuelas and uh, pucheros and bersas that are um, baked casseroles and stews that go by a variety of names in different places. In, in Tucson, there used to be a wonderful place down um, near Five Points uh, on South Stone where you could have menudo, cazuela, cocida, cocido, albón de gas, pozole, and one other soup year round, and then they had seasonal soups. And half of those were things that we could trace back to the old world. Estofado, in many parts of Latin America and even Spain, is reserved for stews that have wild game in them. But that word also carries through um, uh, to the new world and is an ancient one. Uh, ceviches uh, that I mentioned first off, because that was in the appetizers you've just had, um, is related to a whole set of words that I think show some wonderful connections. So many of you also know escaveches. And some of you may know the Italian uh, uh, dish called scapece. And all of those are from uh, um, Arabic and, and Farsi roots, sikbach. So sikbach became Esikbak, and then became Escaveche, and then Ceviche came out of that. And there's South American food historians that cannot believe that Ceviche came originally from any place except <laughs> South America. But I've heard Navajo friends say, well, we've had the horse since the beginning. <laughs> so there, there's strong ties to some of these foods that we shouldn't underestimate, I guess I would say. But um, that's a whole chain of foods that used either um, very acidic citrus juices to cook it, like lime juice cooks fish. And, and literally, it's true. It, it, it's an oxidation kind of cooking rather than a heat kind of cooking. Uh, but um, vinegar is made from a wide variety of plants, including pomegranate vinegar and vinegars that can be made from membrillo or, or quinces. 
were also um, uh, made um, throughout the Middle East and North Africa, and were one of the most common forms of cooking uh, seafood and certain meats. And so in, in northern Mexico and the United States, usually when we get ceviche, it's exclusively with seafoods, but, but um, meats from mammals or other kinds of animals was, were also cooked in lime juice, orange juice, sour orange juice, usually the, the not the Valencia orange, but the, the beautifully sour orange that we have in the medians of streets here. And, and that is literally a kind of cooking. That's not just a metaphorical um, uh, term for, for uh, cooking meats or fish. fish. It, it uh, protects them from microbial um, uh, degradation and uh, protects them from you getting sick. Now, I have had ceviche a couple times in Mexico that didn't meet that standard. <laughs> But, but in general, it's, it's absolutely as functional as heating to cook seafood. Another really interesting connection um, is the um, spicy paste and thick sauces that in, the, in North Africa are called harissas, and, and they're even in the Middle East. And this in, as an example of, of one, I, uh, it says, harissa seasoned pepper paste, pasta sazonada de chile. And um, I do my own with um, the um, Aleppo or Halave pepper, which I think is one of the most divine chili peppers in the world. I may be biased, <laughs> but. Um, I do it with olive oil, pepper, garlic, and um, a little bit of lime juice, and then one or two other spices. But that has morphed and shifted as it went west into a range of incredible, incredible spice paste that now are used almost every in every country in the world. Most of you know that chili-based sauces eclipsed ketchup as the most common condiment in the world um, about 15 years ago, and there's no going back. Uh, uh, you know, ketchup should even be thrown out of the, the category of spices because it's not spicy at all. I, I always tell my friends, I, I had a friend who went to University of Wisconsin. He was of Norwegian background, and when he left for college, his mother said, now, Richard, when you get down to Madison, make sure that you don't have any of that spicy food because, uh, because it'll upset your stomach for days. And he said, well, like, what do you mean by spicy food, Mom? We've never had any in the house. And she said, well, you know, like ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is that, that those um, chili-based sauces that also have a lot of other spices, oregano's, and thymes, uh, like the za'atar uh, thyme uh, dishes that are mixed with sesame seeds and, and other spices, salt, of course, are some of the primary antioxidants that people used when they prepared dried meats like carne machaca, that if you put chili and salt on uh, meat, whether you brush it on or dip it in that, there's five different kinds of antioxidants that keep that meat from putrefying or rotting or whatever nasty word you want to use for that. And in dry climates, hot, dry climates, those are essential to preserving foods. In fact, there's as you move away from the, uh, I was going to say from the creator, from the equator. <laughs> Don't move away from the creator, please, OK? I didn't say that. Um, the number of spicy foods of any kind, all the great spices of Asia, the, the, um, uh, there's just so many of them. I won't even go into them. The ginger uh, family and the, the um, um, malagueta pepper in Africa. And, and, and there's just 
so many other spices we don't think of as savory like chilies, but they all do the same thing. They keep, uh, they're high in antioxidants that keep the, the food from spoiling, and they're especially important in hot countries, whether they're tropical or, or desert. So that's why so many of these things became important here in the New World deserts that originated from the Old World. But they went through a variety of name changes in um, uh, Cadiz, Spain, and Al-Andalus, and in the Canary Islands are called Mojos. In the Yucatan that was primarily settled by um, um, Arab and Jewish refugees from the Inquisition, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, they're called recaudos, not recado like a phone message you know, on your iPhone, but recaudos. And then by the time they get to Puebla and Oaxaca, they're called moles. And down here, uh, we also have uh, salsa matcha and things like that in, in northern New Mexico that are the same kind of thing. It's usually a mix of an oil some salt, one or two minor spices, usually garlic, and a strong chili base. Um, the gazpacho stuff I could go on forever, so I'm going to be really short on that. Uh, um, the Prophet Muhammad's favorite food, according to uh, oral histories, was uh, tarid, uh bread soup, that it was very plain and very simple, and it was the, the food of the poor people, the uh, sort of a campesino, cotidiana kind of food. Um, but along the way, garlic was added to it. And along the way, cucumbers were added to it. And then when tomatoes became available, and so it was transformed in something, into something more like uh, gazpacho. But in parts of Spain, gazpacho still never has tomatoes. It, it's called gazpacho blanco or maimones. Maimones might give you a hint that it had um, an Arabic uh, derivation too. And then there's the dessert ones are just particularly interesting because each main faith in the Middle East that has emigrated to the United States claims that that was their face ancestral dish. And some of those examples are capirotada a bread pudding with dates, raisins, nuts, uh, sometimes cheese or sour cream. In, in places in Egypt that um, I've been, it's called umali, and it's just the best dessert I've ever had. But, but I know Jewish friends who say that's an indicator that a family that moved to the Southwest was hiding their Judaism as conversos, but kept up their traditions at Passover. I've also seen it in Baja, California, where it's the main dessert over the Lenten season, and I've seen it as the main dessert for people celebrating Ramadan. So each group clings to that as an, as an indicator of their own culture and faith, and actually it's multicultural and interfaith. And then we have similar things with uh, bunue bunuelos that are called zalavias, and here in the southwest they're usually called sopapillas, a fried fritter, that here we usually put honey on, but in the Middle East there's all these absolutely delicious um, uh, orange and grapefruit and kumquat sauces, syrups, that are put on, on sopapillas or salavias that are just to die for. So that's just a rundown of those foods that I've been talking about that have traveled with us from the old world to the new world. Change names sometimes, other times the name's almost exactly the same as it was in the Middle East. Now, that's the easy part. <laughs> The hard part is figuring out when they got here and why. And at first, I had as many stereotypes or dismissals of other ways that they got here as uh, world history teachers that I was just uh, uh, saying they didn't tell the whole story. I had always been told that 
All those things came with the Spanish from Moorish Spain. And by the time that they came here, the Jesuits and Franciscans brought them. Because that's the easiest, simplest story to tell about the settlement, colonization of Mexico in the Southwest by people from the old world. We know that that's such a huge simplification now that the very same time that Cristobal Colon set off for the coast of Spain to travel to find the Indies, there was 100,000 Muslims and Jews on the same road with him trying to get to ports to leave the Iberian Peninsula. Many of those people initially went to Morocco and were pushed back, saying, you're no longer like us. We don't want you here. You're, you'd overwhelm our population, an immigrant story that we still hear being reverberated right in our own state at this moment with refugees from another place. But what we now know is that many of them, instead of going back to North Africa, went on to the Canary Islands. And why this has been hidden so much is that in the Canary Islands, to get passage to the New World, they went through a process called blood cleansing, where you gave up your old name, you paid a fee to get new papers with a different last name that couldn't be traced to an Arabic or Hebraic origin. And um, something like 600,000 uh, Jews and Muslims went to the Canary Islands. Different islands had a population dominated by one or the other of those uh, faiths on top of the people who'd been there for centuries in the Canary Islands that primarily came from Morocco. And the interesting thing, according to my dear friend Esteban Arellano, is that there was a tendency for the new apellidos, last names of the Muslims, to be the names of fruit trees, orchard crops, so that they could identify someone of their own faith through kind of a code language. And those include Manzanares, Manzanos, uh, Moras, Morillos, uh, um, uh, Duraznos. Uh, it, it just keeps on going. That, that every fruit you can think of, those became last names of the, of the uh, uh, Moriscos that went to Canary Islands to get new names, where the Jews. Um, often took on names of animals, de la Garza, de Leon, et cetera. I could keep on naming them, but I think you get the picture. And those are still the dominant surnames in Monterrey, Mexico, and Saltillo, where there's a large uh, community of, of uh, people from, from uh, uh, who escaped the Inquisition by going as far north as possible. But why that's a simplification is the whole route is for two reasons. First, we know that Phoenicians as well as Romans came to the Canaries as early as 2,500 to 3,000 years ago. There's Punic runes. Uh, there's a strong correlation, not perfect fit, between Phoenician and, and Punic settlements in North Africa of sailing uh, seafaring people. And they were already out in the Canary Islands long before the Inquisition. Syrians were in Spain when Abdul Rahman II came from, the, from uh, uh, Syria to Spain. So over 3,000 years, that influence of the Middle East on Spain had already happened. It didn't happen just with the arrival with the Muslims um, in Spain. And I want to mention just a couple things I have on the table here. Sort of killed me. One time I was sitting in Palestine, and I, I was really jet lagged. And I 
looking at the plate, trying to remember the little Arabic that I had. And when, when my lunch came to me, it looked like there was a Sonoran tortilla put on my plate. And I couldn't figure out what it was doing there. And it was this called uh, Saj. In some places, it's called Markuk. Now look at the size of that in the Sovaquera tortillas from Sonora. We use the same word for tortillas, whether they're made of corn or wheat. But this is an entirely different process for making a flatbread <laughs> than a corn tortilla. You cannot stretch corn to be this big. And some of these that we see in Lebanon are bigger than any pizza you've ever seen in an Italian restaurant. It's the same intangible cultural heritage that women carry with them of how to make those so that it's handed down grandmother to, to mother to daughter. And it's very, very hard to stretch and make something this big. But the other characteristic is that the komal that they're made on, the, the griddle, is convex and it historically was made of clay. And that word saj is also used for what we call in Spanish the comal. It's the same exact technology. And in fact, it's also the first wheat tortillas in the United States were made with a wheat that we can trace all the way back, uh, uh, bread wheat, to southern Spain and North Africa. We also have things like pomegranates as a garnish. And I grow 31 kinds of pomegranates in my garden. But there's a very touching story that when Abdel Rahman II, uh, the Umayyad family in the palace in Damascus was murdered except for him and his sister, he escaped. And when he got to Spain, he asked for his, the people who brought him to Spain, uh, to Spain to go back and get his sister and get pomegranates, because he couldn't live without either. His sister refused to come when they got back to her through spies. But she gave him pomegranates that had just begun to ripe. And they went on ship all the way to Malaga. And then he worked with a horticulturalist in Malaga to take the seeds from one pomegranate. And that's the start of the whole pomegranate industry in Spain. And descendants of that, the Sahara um, pomegranate are what first made it to the new world. So there's direct lineages that we can trace genetically, the same thing with quinces and a number of other fruit. I want to wrap up by saying that all of this has an incredible relevance today. Arizona is in the worst water crisis in history. We've never paid full attention to the remarkable water management techniques, agronomic techniques, and selection of foods adapted to dry climates that the um, conversos and moriscos that came to the southwest settled northern New Mexico and settled the south, uh, southern Arizona brought with them. We know that Canarians, uh, moriscos who converted to Christianity, were in Tubac, Caborca, Santa Fe, Pecos, San Antonio, et cetera. We know their last names. We know their lineages. And we know that they were part of that first wave of settlements. They brought the irrigation techniques that are still used throughout the Rio Arriba in uh, northern Mexico, the ganats, the water tunnels that are the most water conserving way of moving water. Didn't make it to northern New Mexico or southern Arizona, but are in Coahuila and Puebla and two or three other states in Mexico. All of these things are systems of managing water to conserve it that we now need to incorporate in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas because we are out of water. Our bank account is gone. And we need to look to those deep-seated water management and crop production systems that this Arab uh, Maghrebi heritage was once gifted to us here. And I'll stop there and take questions. <laughs>